through the years, I've met a lot of uh, dry drunks and dry addicts. That, and by that, I mean, they're not using, but they're still just as miserable as they ever were. Is there a difference between sobriety and recovery? We were created by a higher power, the creator of the cosmos that, that wired every single part of you. Uh, those that are listening to this, as I've talked to some guys, you know, uh, that's one of the questions I'll ask is what would have to happen for you to finally decide to do something different? Well, uh, lose my job, lose my family, go to jail, whatever. And it's kind of a tongue in cheek thing, but, but it's kind of like, okay, then that's what I'm going to start praying for. And they're like, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Have you ever listened to this podcast and thought to yourself, I don't struggle with alcohol, drugs, or pornography. I've never been in jail and I've never been divorced or abused. I even attend church on a regular basis. Okay, but let me ask you this. Have you ever had low self-esteem? Have you ever struggled with perfectionism, being a workaholic, getting a little too angry at times, procrastination, laziness, codependency, sarcasm, arrogance, pride, overeating, or selfishness? Has anyone ever hurt you and you struggle with forgiveness? Have you ever struggled to make amends? You see, we all live in a broken world, and we all struggle with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. So I guess the real question is whether or not you see the need for change. Today, I will be asking our guest what the difference is between sobriety and recovery. Do I really need to do an inventory? How important is it that I forgive people who have hurt me in my past? How does spiritual warfare impact change in my life? And finally, how important is it to give back through service? These are fascinating questions, and I can't wait to ask them to my guest. I'm Eric Hutchinson, and this is the If Nothing Changes podcast. Today, I have a guest making a rare second appearance on my podcast. It's rare because most of the time, my podcast is about life change stories. However, if you haven't figured it out yet, it's really about communicating that change is possible. That change may be a turn from addiction and bad choices, or it may be a change in perspective about myself and what has happened to me. Rodney, my friend, my guest, gave his life change story on episode four. And if you haven't listened to it, you should because it's an amazing story. He has seen a lot of change in his own life from his own hurts, habits, and hangups. Rodney is my mentor, my friend, and my sponsor. And his job is actually dealing with people who want change in their life. So I thought it would be awesome to have him back to talk about the process of change and how change takes place in a person's life. So, hey, friend, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners and tell us a little bit about your job and what you do. You bet. Good to be here with you, Eric. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, struggle with drugs and alcohol, uh, struggle well, uh, but still struggle and uh, with perfectionism as well. My name is Rodney, uh, the pastor ministry leader here at Fellowship Celebrate Recovery in Rogers, Arkansas, and uh, just have the privilege of just a fellow struggler helping other people find their way to the path to Jesus. And and uh, as you know, Eric, you're one of those life change stories that uh, are fruit of what we do and, and just helping people get unstuck and uh, find healing from their hurts, uh, change those nasty core beliefs to healthy new truths and Ultimately, find new healthy practices to replace the, the old dysfunctional coping mechanisms that hopefully will improve the relationships around us, especially with God. So that's kind of in a nutshell what my uh, uh, position focus is he here at uh, Fellowship CR. Well, that's a very big nutshell. And so thank you for <laughs> describing that and telling us a little bit about what you do. So I was reading a scripture this morning out of Romans 7. I, I think you're probably pretty familiar with this, but I want to get your thoughts about the scripture. So let me read this to you. This is out of Romans 7. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. 
For I know that good itself does not dwell in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? So what are your initial thoughts of that scripture? Yeah, it's an interesting passage because <clears throat> when I've talked to people, um, even in the courts, and you know, sometimes we have people come through because they're mandated, and I've sat across the table with judges and, and attorneys and even parole officers, and, and one of the things that I think this resonates when you were reading that is, is sometimes we can read that and it can feel like, well, I'm just helpless. I can't, I can't help myself. I can't, you know, I can't, I, the very thing I want to do, I don't do. And the things I do want to do, I don't do kind of thing is, um, it can feel like it's a cop out that, you know, I'm just going to be the way I am. And what I love about Paul's words is it's, it's not a cop out. It's actually an acknowledgement that, I don't have the power within myself to do what needs to be done. And so with Jesus being the source, it's understanding, I can't do this without you, God, and I can't do it without the others in my life. And so uh, it's just an acknowledgement that I'm powerless. So to me, in a nutshell, that's just coming to that reality of something's got to change and I need a, a different source outside of myself to be able to face this. So whenever I read it this morning, the first thing that popped into my mind was, is Paul an addict? Was he an addict? You know, what was, what was he talking about? Was he a, was he a sex addict? Was he, did he have problems with alcohol? Did he, maybe he had struggles with anger. I mean, I just started thinking, wow, you know, this guy who wrote, who wrote half the New Testament, uh, Mm. struggled with some probably some of the same things that I struggle with. And I thought about myself and I thought about, you know, in recovery, how, you know, when I came, I was like, I, I can't, I can't stop doing what I'm doing. I'm looking at pornography and I can't stop it. I've tried, I've told my wife, I've had accountability partners and I could not have victory over this. What a wretched man that I am. And I just read that and I was like, wow, that is, that is me. And then I started thinking, wow, here's this guy who wrote half the New Testament and he struggled with sin and possibly with addiction in his own life. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, you know, that's one thing. It's, it's always a mystery. What's the thorn in his side. Right. But, and I think that's just a good reminder that, that sometimes, sometimes it is addictions. It is pornography. It is alcohol, drugs, whatever, but sometimes it's just life stuff, right? It's, it's the thorn in my side is my low self-esteem. And how does that create uh, bad interactions with the world around me. What's the cost of that? Um, sometimes it's perfectionism, it's people pleasing, workaholism, and so there's other things that I get angry and I don't know why. Um, why do I respond to people the way I do? And so that thorn, that thing, maybe it was an addiction or maybe it was just life stuff, and I can't, I can't deal with this thorn under my own power. I've tried that; it's not working. I want to try something new. So I love that you kind of went there with the discussion because I think a lot of times people listen to my podcast and I've had, you know, 65 episodes and people listen to it and they think, man, uh, I'm not an addict or, you know, I don't uh, struggle with alcohol or I'm not a, I don't struggle with drugs. And so many times I have those kind of guests because those are really extreme before and after pictures. And uh, I think it really shows to God's miracle that he can do. But you know, what if the person just struggles with crankiness, or maybe he just struggles with, you know, uh, laziness or uh, procrastination or whatever. And there's a lot of things that we struggle, which brings me really to the first question that I really wanted to pose to you, which, uh, and I, and it's funny because I was thinking about this and I was rethinking it. And I was going to ask you, you know, why do people want change? But then I thought, you know, that's really the wrong question. Why? Because I think, I think 
in my opinion, the majority of people know that they need to change, that there's some things in their life, because why else would we have New Year's resolutions, right? I mean, every January, people just flood the internet with, here's my New Year's resolution. I'm going to lose 20 pounds or I'm going to do this. And, you know, that. so I think that people want change. So my question to you and your experience is why don't people follow through with that change? Yeah, I think it's a, it, I think in the heart, the longing inside of us wants something different. I think the, the reality part is I think people, and this is just from my experience, this is not a blanket statement, but I think there's to change means that there's a disruption. And when there's a disruption, there's some unknowns in that. And so I think, I think the, the reality of um, sometimes we bu- we buy into the mindset, my life is a mess. I don't like the way things are going. I want it to change, but I don't want anything to be different. <laughs> and it's it sounds weird to say that, but but it's it's that there's a there's an element of control in that. I want to manage my environment. I want to manage my life, but I want it to be different and better. And it's just that reality of understanding that the longing in my heart does want something different. We are created for something different. Uh, there's a longing inside of my heart. So I think the, that fear of losing my safety net um, and falling into God's arms to trust him is a big, big reason why we might not take that step. But just to know that those longings are inside of us. And the way we know that is by what we reach for. we we, we reach for unhealthy things, workaholism, you know, people pleasing, you know, pats on the back, you know, all those things that we need in an unhealthy way. It speaks to the longings in our heart for something outside of ourself. But sometimes when we don't do the right way, we go, we go the wrong way and we do some, some dysfunctional things, but the longing is there. It's just filling that longing with the right source. So I think that fear of the, Uh, losing my protections and safety is probably one of the big ones. So you mentioned fear, and I think uh, I'm trying to remember who the quote was from, but, you know, everything you want is on the other side of fear. And Mm. so many times I I, I want that change, but I'm scared of what that might mean. I'll never forget in my own recovery or not even recovery in my own past, whenever I realized, and I knew I had a problem with pornography. I knew I had a problem with it. And I remember picking up the phone and calling the Minrith Meyer Clinic in Dallas and saying, I've got a problem, you know, I need help. And they said, well, we need you to come in. And I said, let, let, you know, we'll try to get you in some groups and blah, blah. And I said, well, I can't tell my wife if I tell my wife, you know, she'll leave me. And they said, well, unfortunately, that may be a consequence that you will have to, you know, face. But uh, but this is going to be the path of recovery for you. You're going to need to get help. And I was not willing to do that at that point in my life. I was not willing because I was scared of what that might mean for my life. And uh, so, you know, do you think that people really have to get to a crisis point? I mean, in their life before they, they, you know, almost forces them to change? Yeah, I think sometimes there is a crisis point. I think, um, you know, we, we always talk about, you know, that rock bottom is an option, but it's not mandatory. Uh, so I think that, um, you know, pain pain has to become greater than the fear of change. Um, so sometimes, yeah, we were kind of hard headed and we need everything to blow up. And I, I, through the years going into my, I'll be going into my, well, I'm in my 19th ministry year. The, as I've talked to some guys, you know, uh, that's one of the questions I'll ask is what would have to happen for you to finally decide to do something different? Well, lose my job, lose my family, go to jail, whatever. And it's kind of a tongue in cheek thing, but, but it's kind of like, okay, then that's what I'm going to start praying for. And they're like, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. (laughs) But it is, if, if that's what it will take to get you to back to Jesus and peace in your life and, and walking in healthy community and, and having that fruit inside of you, whatever it takes, Lord, and, and that's like a scary thing to pray, um, but, but it doesn't have to come to that. Um, you can be sick and tired of being sick and tired 
and try something new? And can I just, even though I can't see it, can I trust the people around me that are saying, Hey, there's something wrong and it's, it's affecting our relationship. Uh, I don't see it, but I got to trust the people around me. And so I'm just going to take these steps until I do see it. And oftentimes we'll look back and go, man, I'm so glad I finally woke up and I'm, uh, and Eric, you and I know, I mean, there's sometimes guys, they are on their way to prison for things that they've done. And the heartbreaking thing is there were people along the way that were bringing this to their attention. They just ignored it and they thought that they could manage it. And the grateful thing is, and you and I know we're one choice away from being in that same boat. <laughs> um, and so I don't want that. So every time I'm meeting with a guy, it's a reminder of my own story. I don't want to go back to that. I want to keep moving forward. And so, yes, sometimes crisis has to happen. It's just maybe what is your definition of a crisis? And is that enough of a crisis to, to do something? Because it will get worse. And it's just a dependent on how much worse does it have to get before you do something? So let me ask you a question. I'm going to bring in your story a little bit. You, Whenever you were telling, in fact, I went back and listened to your testimony yesterday, and um, you said that there was this moment uh, that you detoxed yourself, that you, that you literally just hunkered down and you literally detoxed yourself, which is an amazing feat by its own. But you, uh, and then you know, it's funny. I use that as the title. You said I was literally scared straight, you know, that yeah. I, I was scared straight. So your motivation, you know, for getting clean was because you were scared out of your, you were the fear motivated you to change. Mm. And you started having sobriety at that time over drugs. I think you said that in your testimony that you were continuing to drink alcohol, but, but the, but the drugs, uh, you you became sober from that. So let me ask you this question in relationship to that. Is there a difference between sobriety and recovery? I mean, mm. what would you say to that? Yeah, most definitely. And, and just speaking on that fear, um, I was talking about this recently, but fear in itself, sometimes we, you know, there's things in scripture that we, you know, do not fear. Our theology will um, kind of override everything. So do not fear. But fear sometimes can be a great catalyst. It can be a motivator to move me to do something different. That's where we get the, the uh, Latin word uh, modus or motis um, from emotion. It literally means to move us to do something different. It, and and so fear in that case moved me to do something different. And so sometimes fear can be a good thing if it's channeled to motivation. So, so yeah, for me, it became a motivator to just fear of uh, people were going to hurt me, you know, fear of my life uh, was going to fall completely apart. And, and so, but so, you know, detoxing on our own is not always the good route to go, but I was kind of forced that way just in my story where I was. Uh, my mom had no idea even what was in my system when I went back to live with her. But so I was literally white knuckling and it was hard to get those drugs out of my system. And sometimes that can be dangerous. Uh, if you're in that place, seek, seek professional help because th that can actually be really dangerous depending on what you're trying to detox from. But but to your question, Eric, I think the, um, for me, um, I, I got sober from drugs and, and my primary drug was cocaine, uh, crack cocaine, um, and, and marijuana and alcohol. But, but I would, I would pretty much put anything in my body that I could find, um, a lot of speed and that kind of thing. But, but so I was sober from those things. Uh, but I wasn't in a healthy space. And that's where recovery comes in is work. We're not trying to just get away from drug use or alcoholism or workaholism or perfection, whatever you want to throw in there. We're trying to move towards something better. And so the difference in that space is, is the, the sobriety is getting away from and that's a good thing. We need to get away from that. We change our people, places, things. That's kind of the common thing that we're looking at. 
but then the recovery is moving toward and freedom for something much better. And that's learning how to replace those old habits with something new. Because if we don't, um, I, through the years I've met a lot of uh, dry drunks and dry addicts that, and by that, I mean, they're not using, but they're still just as miserable as they ever were. And so, uh, anger, resentment, bitterness is still kind of, and that's where I was. That was in my heart still. That was the reason I went to drugs and alcohol to begin with. So I was white knuckle on my way on those coping strategies, but I ended up shifting my addictions to workaholism and, and some other, uh, coping strategies. And so I, I was sober from that, but I was not sober from new things. And so recovery helps us to move towards something better not just away from the things that we're destroying our life, if that makes sense. It makes sense. Um, is a higher power needed for recovery? Yeah, I think for sure. I think, um, you know, there's some, there's some traditional, you know, recovery meetings out there and they're effective in getting people sober. Um, and I don't want to, I'm not talking down about any other resources. Please use uh, some of those other, uh, resources out there if that helps you. But um, there is a faith component that is important. And, and it, the, if your goal is to get sober, it, it's kind of back to what's my, what is my end goal here? Is it just to be away from that? And if that's your goal, then more power to you. Go do that. But if you want to be free for something better, we are not wired. We, got, we were created by a higher power the creator of the cosmos that, that wired every single part of you, uh, those that are listening to this, he knows exactly how you think and how you tick and, and what makes you feel good, what makes you feel sad. And he is the source to give you comfort and care and compassion in those places. And only he can provide and meet the longings that are in your heart that maybe you attempted to fill under your own power that you're trying to get sober from. And so in order to walk in recovery, I firmly believe you have to invite Jesus into that space. We don't force it down people's throat. We tell them, hey, this is a safe place for you, even if you're a non-believer. But we talk about Jesus a lot around here. And the, if you really want and long for, if your goal is to have something better, to be free for something better and greater beyond yourself, then you most definitely have to consider to at least be curious about the possibility of inviting Jesus into that space and trusting him with your life so that you can walk in that recovery space, not just that uh, sober place. Uh, the way we're trying to get away from those uh, nasty habits that we've developed. So I want to uh, ask you this. Why is inventory needed? Why, do, why does uh, someone need to go in and dig up their past? And I know that we're just kind of doing a flyby on this. You don't have to go into you know, major detail, but why, does, why do we need to go deep into our past and dig up all the stuff that's caused us hurt? Yeah, I think the... One is I, I firmly believe that we are wired. I mean, just even looking at the scriptures in James, you know, that that we confess so that we can be healed. Um, and then what what's my part that needs to be evaluated and where I can take responsibility, not to shame myself, but to understand why I do what I do. And 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 sometimes we see the 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 behaviors uh, that we're doing. And sometimes those behaviors are severe and sometimes they're, they're minor, but they're all costly is um, we'll try to manage the behavior. Hey, stop doing that. And, and so we'll manage the behavior and, and yet we haven't, we haven't leaned in to understand why we're doing the behavior. Um, if, if every time I walk around a corner of my house, I flinch because I'm scared. I want to understand why. Oh, there's a story where every time you walked around the corner, somebody was there with a bat, right? That's a very simplistic example, but, but I want to understand the parts of my story and, and the trauma, you know, trauma in itself in a nutshell is where there's an event that happened where somebody should have been there for me and they weren't. 
And so I needed someone to be there for me and they, they dropped me. And so there's some wounds that come with that, not to justify my behavior, but to understand it. And so to unpack the inventory process is to understand where did I first learn some of these lies that I'm believing? Uh, when did I first start using this as a coping strategy? And did something happen in, in my family system? Again, not to blame my family, but to, to be honest uh, is actually a really honoring thing to do so that I can ultimately take that to Jesus and, and break that down and allow him to heal it so that it will uh, eventually change my choices. And so to come to him with complete vulnerability is, is, a, is a trust. It's a, it's a strong faith move to be able to say, God, here I am, and here's what's happened to me. So, you know, sometimes when we look at the cross, uh, we do only focus on um, what we've done. And that is a big part of the cross, what Jesus took. But we forget that the other side of the cross is just as much on the things that were done to me. We tend to focus on the my part and just change the behavior, nail it to the cross, and that is something we need to do. But but to do the inventory helps us to understand the wrong that was done to me and being able to nail that to the cross. Dan Allender says that the, you know when I look at the cross, it reveals who I am and what I need. And that, that space of who I am, a big part of that story is how, how did I come to become the person I am today through hurt from a broken world done to me? And as a result, the hurt that I've done to others in a broken world as, because of the choices that I made. The inventory process helps us to examine that. And so it's hard to do that. But man, it's so, so important. If, if I were going to do surgery on you to, today, Eric, and cut you open, there was, you know, you, there's a tumor inside of you we're going to go cut, cut out of you. If I cut you open, uh, which is kind of gross to think about, I know, but bear with me, um, and I saw 10 more tumors, would you want me to just take the initial one out <laughs> that, that I thought was there? No, you would want me to take all 10 out because they're poisoning my body. And so that's the inventory process. As we examine that, we go, oh, I thought it was just this, but there's more there. And, and, and it's scary to kind of go into those places. But if we can remember those things, God will give us the power to carry us through it. And if it does, does come to mind as a memory, that's just our body saying, hey, I'm ready to, to deal with this. And, and then that's the power of inviting Jesus into that inventory process so that he can ultimately, as we get honest, bring healing to that. So, but the, in a nutshell, that's the value of the inventory so that we can get to new healthy practices as we understand the reasons for the unhealthy practices, not just manage the behavior. Yeah, I think it, for me, it was really important to realize that the pornography was acting out, that that was, that that was the surface. I started realizing that it was my character defect of lust, and there were some other things going on underneath there. I used it as medication for my divorce and the hurt of that. And so I love the definition of the, you know, a character defect is an underlying cause of of why I act out. And that was really mm. important for me to start going after those character defects in that inventory process. But I wanted to ask you, you know, a lot of people say, well, I can just, well, I just do an inventory myself. I mean, why do I need to bring someone else into that process? I mean, I can just, mm. uh, you know, I can read about it and okay, here's what I got to do. I got to write it down and I'll just, I'll just go over that myself. Why is it important to bring someone else into that and to, you know, confess or admit that those are things that I'm struggling with. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, so many different things I could say on this. But the, I think the there's such incredible um, power in when I share a part of my story. This is why our share groups are so, so critical, no, no, no matter how long we've been in the process, but, but specifically to the inventory, when I'm sharing my inventory, um, one, there's a responsibility aspect, right? It becomes more real when I speak it out loud to another safe, and that's the key, a safe human being of the same sex. Um, 
but then also um, just the healing aspect that when I see my pain in your eyes and it, it makes my pain more real and going, Oh, this is, I see it hitting Eric. This is, this is not just a news reporter reporting some bad news. This is actually my story. And so allowing myself to feel that can help me heal that. And I think that confessing to one another, admitting what I've already confessed to God, to another human being makes it more real. And so that's good encouragement. If I'm in an open share group on an hour meeting, I'm going to speak three to five minutes of the hour meeting. It's like, well, well, that was a waste of time. No, it's actually the most valuable time. One, I'm hearing from you and I'm learning. It's, it's helping me grow in my recovery. But for the person sharing, um, most of the time you're a part of their healing process just by looking in your eyes and seeing you're, you're safe for me, you hear me, you see me, and you're catching me with your eyes in my pain. And every time we do that, it's another layer of healing and so we play a significant role in each other's, in God's healing path. And that's, that's why we want to share that with, with each other in that space. So I love that you're saying healing and you're talking about that because that's, I mean, that's why I feel like many approach recovery in the first place. But let me ask you this, how important to the healing process is forgiveness and making amends? I think they're critical. I think, I think one of the things that I was trying to encourage uh, folks in our ministry to think about is it's a necessity to the process, but don't rush it. Um, we don't want to force that. There's a reason why it's in the order that it is. We don't say, Hey, welcome to celebrate recovery. You better forgive all those that hurt you <laughs> or go, go, go check in with all those that you heard and make amends right now. That can actually be more harmful because the, the transformation process solidifies the forgiveness and the healing uh, through amends. And forgiveness, I think I've talked about this before, but forgiveness is uh, not a one and done thing, right? It's, it's, a, it's an act of obedience. And sometimes we will equate forgiveness to healing. Well, if I'm still hurting, I must not have forgiven them. The reality is you can choose to forgive somebody and still be, be on the healing journey. It took me many years to be able to heal from the wounds from multiple stepfathers. But I really believe I forgave them a long time ago. I was just dealing with the effects of their hurt. Um, if I still have bruises on my body, they're still there. I can't, well, I forgave you, so this bruise must not hurt anymore. Well, the bruise is still there, the broken bones, all that. And emotionally, it's the same way. So is don't rush that. Trust the process and make a decision to uh, forgive. And sometimes that's every day for years I'm choosing to forgive. But then, Lord, help me with the healing process. It's I'm this is how it, their hurt, their action affected me. And I'm raising this up to you to put on the cross, Lord. But but essential because the bitterness and the resentment doesn't go away without forgiveness. And I don't think we can fully walk in his grace and, and freedom, if we don't learn how to extend it, it's like a, a circular motion. If one of those is clogged up, we don't get the fullness of that circle. And so it's embracing his grace so that he's lavished his love on me so that I can then lavish my love on other people. Doesn't mean I reconcile, but I can lavish my love through forgiveness and amends because he's lavished his love on me. And that begins to break down the bitterness and resentment from the wounds that we've caused others and uh, done to us. So pretty critical part of the healing process. So I love that um, for myself and I think for everyone that's in the recovery process or that enters this journey is that I let people in my past hold power over me because, and what was funny is that I thought I was, you know, for me, resent, resentment was getting them back or I was, you know, I was, you know, hurting them, but I really wasn't hurting them. I was hurting myself. You know, uh, what's the saying, you know, uh, resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. You know, it's like, uh, I just keep drinking this resentment and anger and, and all this stuff and it's doing nothing but just eating me up 
inside. And so forgiveness uh, and making amends was a huge release in my own recovery. So, uh, I, and I know we're, we're getting close on time, but I want to ask you this. Do you believe in spiritual warfare? And if you do, how does that, how did that play out in your own life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there, there's a, an enemy that's constantly trying to pull us back into his playground trying to pull us back into that that headspace and those those negative core beliefs that are not of or from God and so yeah definitely I mean it you know as Christians we're going to be uh, fighting against those those powers right that and that but but we have an uh, a father who's already won that battle and it's so important to, to note that 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 we, we shouldn't be afraid of that, that we have a power that lives in us in the Holy Spirit that can, that can fight for us and work in us and work for us and through us through those battles. But, but yeah, definitely spiritual warfare. I mean, that's kind of the heart of, of sin, right? I mean, the, the enemy through spiritual warfare is trying to, to snag God's kids and pull them away from what is life giving and he takes that life from us. And so we have to be mindful of that. That's why principle seven is such an important part of our process. And you can start day one on, right? Is just spending time with him and inviting him into our walk today and trusting him that, that he's going to fight our battles for us. Will we just be willing to let him knowing that there's a, there's a, an enemy that's trying to take us out every minute of the day, but with Christ being our armor, uh, we can face those battles with uh, confidence. So um, how important is it to give back? Yeah, it's, it's critical. And I think the, it's the overflow, right? We don't produce fruit. Uh, the fruit is, is grows in us from a source outside of ourselves, And that fruit that's the beauty of it. If there's fruit growing in us, it can't help but overflow. And, and so if I have no desire to serve, I probably need to examine my recovery in general. Am I really, uh, have I healed some of those wounds? Is there, is there some things I need to go back and give to the Lord? Because selfishness is the root of the dysfunction, right? That's pride and selfishness. And so I probably have to go back to principle one and go, God, am I making myself God or do I really recognize you as my higher power? So but yeah, it's the fruit, it's the overflow of what God has done in the process. Um, and yeah, we gotta get we gotta give back. We can't keep it unless we give it away, as we say in celebrate yeah. recovery. Very important. Do you have any verses that you'd want to to share with the listeners that really is meaningful to you? And or uh do you have one message that you would say, hey, if you're thinking about change, if you're thinking and that's really what we're talking about, recovery is change. So uh what message do you want the listeners to hear? What's the what's the one key thing that you'd like to communicate? Yeah, I mean, probably, I mean, I read this in my testimony. I was actually sharing it with you this morning. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight thirty 30 is one of my favorite verses. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. For my burden is light and my yoke is easy. Is whatever you're carrying, um, back to Paul's words, just come to that realization Hey, what I'm trying to do isn't working. The things that I don't want to do, I do, vice versa is just come to him and trust him in the process. Jeremiah 17, 7, 8 is another one. We're blessed when we put our complete confidence in him, uh, that we become a, like a tree along the stream that sends its roots out into the water, that even in a year of drought, we would not fear. And so uh, be that tree planted along the stream. Put your complete confidence in him. Uh, he's calling you. Come, to, come to me. He says he'll give you the rest in your chaos, and and that's a beautiful picture. If we'll just accept that. Rodney, thanks so much for answering my questions and sharing just a little bit of your wisdom with us. Hey, if you are listening today, and maybe you don't struggle with addiction, maybe you haven't had some tragedy in your life, and maybe you're already a believer in Jesus Christ. However you still see the need for change in your life. We have a saying in recovery that says, pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. 
Jesus can not only give you eternal life, but he can give you peace and healing in this life as well. Change is possible. However, if nothing changes, nothing changes. See you next time. Hey, if you are still listening and you like this podcast, I want to encourage you to listen to previous episodes because they will help to inspire change in your life. Also, if you like what you hear, please leave a positive review because it helps to bring this podcast to others. But no matter what, may God bless you and may God bring positive change to your life.